here know who this gentleman is? The gentleman in this picture? All right. shout, just shout out the name if you know who he is. Jay-Z. All right, Jay-Z. This gentleman actually happens to be from the same neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York that I'm from. Okay, so you heard that, that um, Lauren Sisler's from, from Virginia. She's a Southern girl. I am not Southern. Okay? You can probably hear that in the way I speak. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, a little neighborhood called Bedford-Stuyvesant. All right? And that's the same neighborhood that Jay-Z is from. And, but I'm a bit older than Jay-Z, so I came through Bed-Stuy much, much sooner than he did. Um, and, but I will tell you, uh, as you can see here, Jay-Z was, has been very, very successful right, in, in, his, in his career. Does anybody know what career Jay-Z had before he became a rapper? Who can tell me? Say it. I heard somebody say it. Drug dealer, correct. And so that is the, the Jay-Z that as he lived in, in Bed-Stuy, in Brooklyn, before he uh, became um, a rap star and a, and a, and a businessman and a mogul and a, and a multimillionaire and all that good stuff. And before he had the good fortune to marry uh, the, the young lady that you saw in that previous picture. Right? This is what he looked like back when he was in Bed-Stuy, when he was a drug dealer. And, and, you know, there's, that's actually Marcy Projects. That's where he grew up, in Marcy Projects. That's like a maybe 15, 20 minute walk from where I grew up in, in Bed-Stuy, all right? And here's actually what he probably looked like back in the day, uh, sitting out, chilling out in front of Marcy Projects. I have no idea how I found that picture, but I, <laughs> but I have that picture of Jay-Z hanging out in Marcy Projects where he grew up, all right? So, drug deal. And, and when we think of drug dealers, this is what we imagine, right? This is what we think of. This is a drug dealer. This is what a drug dealer looks like, right? But in fact, what we've had to learn uh, the hard way with this opioid epidemic that we have going on is that the drug dealers that many of us have to be much more concerned about than the ones who look like this are actually ones who look like this, right? This is the drug dealer that we, many of us, have to be concerned about. These are the drug dealers that, that literally have been responsible for the opioid addiction and opioid overdose epidemic that we have going on in this country right now, all right? And here's the other thing about it. There's another group of people, a much larger, larger group of doctors that don't look like that, they just look like this. These people all too often are unwitting unintentional drug dealers. And that is to say that they are not trying to be drug dealers. They're not trying to do anything other than help you. They want to help you to not be in excessive pain. They want to make sure that you are not in, in agony after they've done some procedure on you or what have you, right? And yet what has happened is because of this problem of over-prescribing opioids, unfortunately we doctors have been contributors to this problem as well. Now, you would think, all the years that we've had this opioid epidemic going on, and with all of the effort that there's been educating doctors and educating the general public, and the fact, is, the fact of the matter is that the numbers have gone down. The over-prescribing of opioids has really decreased. But I'm here to tell you, and I don't really have to tell you, because you probably have experienced it yourself, this problem is not over. And I have a personal experience that I can share with you to give you an example of what I mean by that. This is my leftover bottle of hydrocodone from, from when I went to a dentist two to three weeks, about three weeks ago now. My own personal dentist. Now mind you, my dentist knows me very well. My dentist knows what I do for a living. My dentist knows that I eat, sleep, and breathe trying to help people get off of drugs and trying to teach people about the opioid epidemic. My dentist and I talk about this all the time. My dentist is an awesome dentist. I will kill you before I'll let you take me away from my dentist. I love my, my dentist is amazing. Let's be clear about this. And he and I sat when he was doing this very painful root canal on me, right? And I've had root canals before, but this one just wasn't going well, folks. This one was taking several visits, taking several hours. It was painful. And it was the first time I've ever had a dental procedure where I actually said to him, you know, doctor, I'm going to probably need an opioid, which just goes against everything I believe in, but I'm going to need an opioid for the pain after this one. And I said to him, but I only need a little bit, because I'm only going to end up taking maybe a day's worth, maybe two at the max. I'm not going to need much. 
And he and I actually ended up in a negotiation because he wanted to give me a little bit more because he knew it was painful. And he knew he was taking a long time and having a hard time getting done what he needed to get done. And he wanted to give me more. And I kept telling him, I promise you, I'm not going to need much. I'm not going to need you to give me much, just a little bit, just enough for one day at the max. And so he, he ended up prescribing it to me. I ended up taking one hydrocodone later that night, and that was all I needed. So even I have almost a full bottle of hydrocodone left over after my dentist appointment. So, so it, it struck me that if I, the till of the hun on addiction treatment, <laughs> guy who lives and breathes and teaches this stuff and takes care of patients and educates the entire NBA about the dangers of prescription painkillers if they get injuries or after they have surgery, if, if I can end up with extra hydrocodone after my dental visit, I can only imagine the risk for everybody else out there when you go to a doctor or a dentist. And so I want, one of the things I really want to get across to you is that you folks are going to have to take the lead. So I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. If you think about drug addicted people, right, people with addictions, very often for a long, long time, this was the sort of prototypical picture. This is what we assume they look like, all right? But I'm here to tell you, and unfortunately, we've all learned this the hard way as a country, this disease does not discriminate, okay? It doesn't care what, what gender you are, what race, what socioeconomic level, what part of the country, what religion, this disease does not discriminate, okay? So this is the, the stereotypical picture that we had of people with addictions, but now they could just as easily look like this, okay? And we all understand that, all right? So we're all in this together. We all have to fight this battle together, all right? Now, I wanted to come back to this issue of, of, of what you do, because this is my six degrees of separation between your kid and opioid abuse. If it can happen to me that I've got a whole lot of extra hydrocodone, then you know you have to go in there too. After with your, when you take your youngster to a doctor's appointment or a dentist's appointment or what have you, you've got to go in there with the plan to manage this prescription that your child is going to get, okay? And this six degrees of separation is, is, is a set of suggestions that I would, I would tell you that every parent should, be, should uh, learn about and try to implement. Number one, ask the doctor if opioids are actually necessary for the pain relief that your, your, your youngster had. I, had. I actually asked the doctor for an opioid this one time, but I've had previous dental procedures. I've had actual oral surgery in which I did not actually need an opioid at all. Well, you know, ibuprofen was all I needed. It's not always necessary for every procedure or for every, every kind of pain problem that you have to be on an opioid. Ask the doctor to realis realistically, realistically estimate how long are you going to need that opioid? How long is the pain going to be so severe that you need opioid level pain relief? Because you want to only get the amount in a prescription that will cover that length of time and have as little extra as possible. You also want to ask the doctor to prescribe only enough to cover that time, and then you, the parent, take hold of the prescription. You don't give it to your youngster. I know you've got a good young. I have two great youngsters. All right? My kids were awesome, and, and, and they did really, really well, and neither one of them ever had a substance abuse problem. But still, if I had it to do over again, even knowing what I know now about how great they turned out and how neither one of them had a problem, there's no one in the world I would let them. Have, take their own prescription if I were doing it again and they were teenagers. It's just not a wise thing to do. Transition as soon as possible to some non-opioid kind of medication. Think about this. There are lots of ways that, 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 lots of medications that can treat pain that aren't necessarily prescription opioids, that aren't necessarily uh, potentially addictive. All right? And so the opioids, you only need those for the most severe pain. That's why I only needed one hydrocodone tablet that night after my, my horrific root canal. All right? And then after that, I was on motion and I was fine. All right? So think about transitioning as soon as possible. And then what do you do after that? You do the same thing I'm going to do as soon as we leave here. I'm driving this. I found at my pharmacy, my, my Walgreens pharmacy up there on, on Highway 150 has a little box where you can take your, your extra medicine and you can dispense, dispense it there, dispose of it there, all right? That's why I, why I brought that, because it would be a great prop for you, but also 
I've been planning to, to take that thing and, 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 and take it there, and this is my opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Yes, yes. There's there's a there's a package of Deterra, which is a, a package that in all of your gift bags that will um, you can use to dispose of. Thank you. Can I borrow this for a second? It looks like this that you can use to dispose of old medication, particularly um, potentially addictive medication. Thank you for that. So so again, um, but that's what I'm, that's the other reason that I brought this is because I'm literally driving to that Walgreens after this, and I'm going to get rid of it that way. All right. So. Those are the six degrees of separation. If you do those things, that's one way to decrease the risk that your youngster will start using opioids. All right. Now, um, I, I know I've got, I'm, 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 I'm have to be very, have to be very careful about time. Uh, I would like to have a young lady, uh, specifically a young lady, and one who does not know anything about boxing. So please raise your hand. Okay. Good. Perfect. You're in the right spot. Come on. Come on. All right. Now. Well, you and I are going to box, all right? <laughs> now, you ready? Okay, good. Now, when you're boxing me, right, and you're seeing what I'm doing, you know nothing about boxing, right? Right. But then, if I'm boxing you, and then I do this, what are you going to do? <laughs> go ahead. No, just go ahead. That's exactly what happens, right? When, so, you know, even... I had to prompt you a little bit, but you knew <laughs> that if I'm boxing you and I put my hands down, that's an opportunity to get knocked out. That's right. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> really nice. What you see here um, is a picture of a gentleman. He's actually another one of my homeboys, actually. He grew up in Brownsville, which is the very next neighborhood over from Bed Stuy, uh, the one delivering the punch, not receiving. Uh, and, and he was the classic example of if you let your guard down, you can get knocked out. The reason I'm showing you this, this picture is because I think it illustrates something that's extremely important. And that is with this disease of addiction, with the, the risk factors that, that can affect our young people to develop addiction, it's the same principle. If you let your guard down, you can get knocked out. We have to remain vigilant. Okay? So that was the whole point of mine showing you that. Now, so, so I have this parents prevention rule that I'd like to share with you. All right? Number one, jump on it early. If you see something that's a little suspicious, that's a little off with your, with your youngster, some, you know, something that's in their bag that shouldn't be there, jump on it early. Don't just think, well, you know, it's probably nothing. I'm not going to get you too worried about it. Jump on it early. Be aggressive. Aggressively pursue it. Okay, now I'm a, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I've been taking care of kids for many, many years. And I understand the importance of a teenager having privacy. But you know what? When it comes to you trying to make sure that your youngster is not developing a problem with a substance, forget about privacy. That's just not the priority. You, you need to have the attitude that you'll do whatever it takes to keep your youngster safe. All right? And never let your guard down, like I said before. All right, so just remember those three principles. Jump on it early, be aggressive, never let your guard down. So here's the drug use spectrum. People talk about how the kids get started with drugs, right? The drug use spectrum, first you have experimentation, right? And kids try a little bit of stuff, you know, this, it's actually a normal part of adolescent development to try, try and experiment with new things, right? Then there's periodic use. Some youngsters, a smaller number, as you can see, will go on to periodically using the substance. And then there's a, an even smaller number that will develop regular use of substances of, of one sort or another, whether it's alcohol or, or whatever, marijuana, whatever the substance. And an even smaller number will go on to frequent or constant use, right? And then the smallest number will go on to addictive or compulsive use, all right? And so a lot of people might think, well, if my kid's not in the the regular use category, or in the frequent or constant use category, or maybe the addictive use category, then I don't need to worry so much. It's pretty normal for them to experiment, right? Well, I want to challenge that notion. I want you to think about the fact that anywhere up and down this drug use spectrum, I hope this is going to come up, maybe it won't. Yeah, that's what can happen. Anywhere up and down that spectrum, death can take place even in the experimentation stage. So when you notice that your youngster is experimenting with substances, get concerned. Again, jump on it early. Be aggressive. Never let your guard down. 
because even at the experiment, experimentation stage, death can occur. All right, and, and you have to keep keep your mind on that because so often when when deaths occur, and you heard you heard our our tremendous keynote speaker say this, a lot of times families have no idea. It comes completely out of the blue. It absolutely cold cocks you, and you and you're thinking, how could that have happened? All right, so you don't wait. You don't take a chance. So. The, the, perhaps the greatest example of this in all of sports. Anybody know who that guy is? Uh, Lynn Myers. He got slowly gotten what? Yeah. Yeah, he got drafted by the Celtics and died maybe a day or two later from cooking. Awesome. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. All right, say it again louder, please. Uh, Lynn Myers. He played for Maryland, got drafted by the Boston Celtics. He died two days later from a um, heart attack due to cocaine. But that's correct. Now, you know, my wife and I have this discussion all the time. She, she was fussing at me before when I was preparing to come here earlier today because she said, you used that Len Bias example, and that happened over 30 years ago, and nobody's going to remember him. Nobody knows about him. So for the record, sir, how old are you? You're 30 years old. This happened before you were born, didn't it? Three years. Uh-huh. <laughs> I want y'all to tell my wife this. The next time she, she couldn't make it here tonight, but I want y'all to tell her. All right. So, so he's absolutely right, folks. This is Len Bias. If you notice in the picture on the right, did anybody pick up on who happens to be trying to play defense on, against Len Bias? Who that guy is? Say, shout it out. Michael Jordan. Do you realize, folks, that at the time that that picture was taken and at the time that this happened, that Len Bias was considered to be a better player than Michael Jordan? He was considered to have more potential to be successful in the NBA than Michael Jordan, who many people consider to be the best ever. All right? That's how talented Len Bias was. That's how incredible a basketball player was. So as a res uh, basketball player he was. So as a result, in the 1986 draft, he was drafted number two overall. And as our, our brilliant historian here, uh, who he, who's even studied stuff from before he was born, has shared with you, right, he died. But here's the thing, folks, the reason I use this example. He died from an overdose of cocaine, and he had tried it one time. It was the first time he had ever tried cocaine. He was in the experimental stage, the experimentation stage, in that, in that uh, example, that graphic that I showed you. And it, and it killed him, totally ruined his, his life. And, and, and there's, a, there's a, um, a 30 for 30 documentary, ESPN 30 for 30 documentary out, in, entitled Without Bias, right? Uh, and, and it shows not only did it have ripple effects for his family and devastated all the people who loved him, but for so many people it had incredible ripple effects when, when Len, ba Len Bias died. All right? Just experimentation. You know, all kids experiment. Don't think that. I'm sorry? How um, old was he? I'm not sure how old he was, actually. I think he um, was maybe 21 or 22. Our expert says 21. 21. Thank you. <laughs> the expert says 21. So we're going to say we're going to go with 21. All right. So, so this idea that they're just experimenting, I, just, I hope I've satisfied everybody's um, you know, suspicion that, that, that they don't need to be worried about experimentation. All right? So. Here's another thing. This, this actually happened. We, we, uh, a, a, a friend of mine invited me to, to speak in a, on a panel some, quite some years ago. And, and, and we, we panelists together on a panel discussion. You don't need to worry about trying to read that, but I just wanted to show you that this was an actual note that I got from my friend. We did this panel discussion, and I, in, in that, on that panel, I was, I was emphatic in talking about how parents need to jump on it early. Be, be suspicious, be concerned, have a high index of suspicion if you see something going on with your youngster and a low threshold for taking action on it. All right, and I really pushed that. And so this was probably a week or so after that, that uh, panel discussion, and this is what he sent me. He said, uh, you know, first part was talking about how, you know, the great, the great um, uh, uh, attendance that we have, but then in the second part, Today I spoke to a mother who attended. About a year ago, they became aware of some alcohol and pot use by their teenage son. A year ago, just alcohol and pot, right? Since, she said, they've been concerned but had no evidence of ongoing problems. Again, how did this happen? How could that have happened? Families, how can a family not know, right? 
As a result of attending the panel, she and her husband decided to search his backpack. Hooray, forget about that privacy nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. They found evidence of ongoing and more serious drug use. They spoke to him, he admitted to it, and he's going to get treatment. You know, jump on it early, be aggressive, never let your guard down. So, why would I bore you with a long definition of addiction? Right? From the, from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, of which I am a member, right? Look, the, the, the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine defines addiction. This so-called short definition of addiction is anything but short, right? But it is an excellent definition of addiction. What, and, the reason, and I have a reason for going through this, folks, so please bear with me. Addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward. We could stop right there and I could, I could give you a whole discussion of that for an hour. What that means is we psychiatrists, you've heard me tell about a psychiatrist, we psychiatrists have been among the worst, historically speaking, uh, for telling people the misinformation that, that addiction is really just a symptom of an underlying mental health problem, an underlying issue like depression or anxiety or what have you. And that if you simply ignore the drug use for a while, but pay attention to the underlying problem and give treatment and, and hopefully cure that underlying problem, then the drug use will just sort of melt away, right? The idea being that the drug use was secondary to the underlying, the real problem. And folks, that has proved, proved to be completely wrong, totally wrong. And a lot of folks suffered for a long time because of us psychiatrists telling people the wrong thing. The fact of the matter is addiction is a primary disease. A person may also have, and, and usually does, also have depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, some other co-occurring mental health condition. But that means that they now have two primary conditions. They have an addiction disorder and they have the other co-occurring mental health condition. And you cannot think about trying to uh, hope that the addiction problem is going to go away just by treating the other problem and not paying very specific attention to the, the addiction disorder. Okay, so it's a primary condition. It is a chronic disease. A chronic disease. What does that mean? What it means is that like, Dr. Wally will, Wally will um, treat uh, okay, well, she won't anymore because she's a professor. She's a big shot. But the, <laughs> but the interns and residents under her, right, will treat kids who will who have an ear infection and they may or or maybe pneumonia or something, and they'll give them antibiotics. And when they t finish taking that course of antibiotics, the infection is cured. They are cured. The disease is over. We'll follow up with them, of course, to make sure that there's not a recurrence or something or it wasn't a resistant uh, bacterium that caused the problem, but, they, but basically it's cured. With addiction, when you send somebody to an addiction treatment program for their addiction problem, it is not cured. Addiction is a chronic <coughs> relapsing disease. It can be treated and it can be controlled, but it cannot usually be cured. And that's so important to understand, because when you have your loved one who's been in and out of rehab five times, six times, seven times, the response isn't, to think that addiction just can't be treated and can't be, it can't be controlled. The response isn't to say that your loved one is just a schmuck because he doesn't really want to get well. The, the response is figure out what went wrong, figure out how we can perhaps do this better and more effectively this time, and go right back to getting them back into treatment, okay? So those are the, the, the key things that I wanted to talk about. Um, Lauren's already flashed the five minute sign, so I'm, I'm gonna move on. Um, the, the, um, the, other, the other point I have to make from this, though, is this. Notice this last word in this, in this first paragraph, and the last three words, and other behaviors. In 2011, that was the first time when the American Society of Addiction Medicine recognized that addiction, it's not only is it not a drug-specific disease, that is to say, if you have an addiction to one drug, you can have an addiction to another drug, all right? Uh, but it also recognized that other behaviors can also fit under this disease of addiction. So it is possible for somebody to have a shopping addiction, or a sex addiction, or a gambling addiction, right? Or even a food addiction. And the same circuitry in the brain that where they can show the, the problems that occur, and I, don't, I have slides that I don't have time to show you about this, uh, the, the same circuitry that's involved in the addiction to cocaine or crystal meth or opioids, that's the same exact circuitry that's involved in somebody who has a sex addiction or a shopping <coughs> addiction or an internet pornography addiction. Okay? So it's not a drug-specific disease. It's not even a behavior-specific disease. 
These are some warning signs of teen drug use, and I believe that you're going to be covering that later, so I'm not going to waste time on that. What do you do to prevent your youngsters from developing an addiction? And after this, I go through this stuff, I promise I'll shut up. All right? Uh, what do you do to prevent your youngsters? Well, what does this show you? Family time, family rules, family standards, right? And, and, and family uh, togetherness, all right? You need to communicate as a family with your youngster. Your youngster needs to understand what your family standards are. And you need to be willing to, to share that time with your youngster. Family meals taken together as much as possible. Now look, you know, my wife is a, is, a, is a heck of a lot smarter and more educated than I am. She's an MD and a PhD. Has her, her medical degree from actually UAB right here. Um, so when my, my kids, like all of yours, were running a million different places. And I've always been a very busy professional. So I, I get that this is really difficult to do, like having your meals together every night at 6 o'clock. That just didn't happen in my household. All right? but, but, and, and so I understand that it's not realistic for every family. But, but spending a lot of time with your youngsters, making your, sure you communicate to them, that is very realistic for families. And it makes a very big difference. All right? So that's one rule. This is actually, and again, all, everything I'm saying here, by the way, has been borne out by the research into what helps prevent young people from developing substance use problems. So again, family time, family meals, family standards, okay? Here's the other one. Don't be afraid to be that till of the hun parent who's more strict than the other parents, okay? Don't be afraid to be that. In fact, that's actually a good thing. When you set your standards, you stick to them. You don't have to be your kid's friend. You can be that unpopular parent, that ridiculous, overprotective, extremist parent that doesn't let your kid do the stuff that all the other kids are allowed to do. It's okay to be that parent. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you this. Um, this is where I went to undergrad. During freshman week, some of you, many, many of you went, went to college, you will remember during freshman week before classes start, you have the time to spend hanging out with all the other new freshmen coming in, and you sit around until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and you just talk about all kinds of stuff, and you solve the world's problems together. Well, we did that during my freshman week as well. And what, in the course of talking, one of the things that uh, one of us mentioned was the fact that, you know, I was that kid whose parents would always had an early curfew for me. All of my friends were able to go out and hang out and do all kinds of fun stuff when I had to be in the house. And it was just ridiculous. My parents were overprotective. They were extremists. They were ridiculous with their rules. And I was so mad at them. And lo and behold, like every other kid who was there with us, there were like six of us, were like, you too? <laughs> I was there too. And then one of us actually said, well, maybe that has something to do with why we're here. <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, that doesn't guarantee that by being a good parent, your kid's necessarily going to end up at an elite Ivy League institution. But it does say that there's something, there's some commonality here about the young people whose parents are those extremist, till of the hun, independent thinking, uh, overprotective parents who have rules that no other kid seems to have to follow. All right? Don't be afraid to be that parent. Third, third and final point I want to make on, on preventing your youngster from, from developing uh, a substance use problem. Start with the man or woman in the mirror. The fact of the matter is I've worked with, I worked with NBA athletes, right? So I've met every single guy in the NBA. You mention their name, I know them, I've met them. You know, if I run into them somewhere, I'll, you know, hug them, dap them up, whatever. I know these guys, right? But believe it or not, when your kids are making decisions about whether or not they're going to use substances and how they're going to use substances and what their relationship is going to be to substances, it's not going to be LeBron whose example they're going to follow. It's not going to be Steph Curry, despite the fact Steph Curry seems to be a tremendously good example. I think he is a tremendously good example for people. They're not going to follow those guys. The people that your young people are going to follow are sitting in this room, all right? They're the ones that they're going to follow. But they're not necessarily going to just do what you say. They're going to pattern themselves after what you do, all right? So if you want to prevent your young person from developing a problem with substances, start with the man or woman in the mirror. This, by the way, is my favorite Michael Jackson song of all time. <laughs> Uh, start with the man or woman in the mirror. If you, for example, I was talking to somebody earlier today who was talking about um, how, how he's in recovery from, from addiction. Uh, if you happen to have a substance use issue and you know that you've had a substance use issue, 
Understand that that means your youngster is at increased risk beyond above the general population. Uh, and, and recognize that you need to share that with your youngster in a healthy way and try to help your youngster to understand the risk that they're under. If you are someone who comes home every day after a hard day of work and excuse me, has to fix yourself a drink in order to just make it through the rest of the evening, you need to check on that. You need to look at that because that's something that your youngster is going to observe. All right. So start with yourself and recognize if you have some patterns or, 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 or some problematic relationship to substances, that's something that you're going you're gonna to have to look at and you're going to have to deal with. If, on the other hand, you're somebody who's actually in recovery from addiction, hey, nothing wrong with taking your young student to an open AA meeting, perhaps, so they can understand what recovery is and understand how devastating this disease of addiction can be. All right? So those are the, the, the things that I wanted to share with you. I'm already over my time, Lauren. It's been really nice for you to jump up and down and, and, and come up here and slug me. But, but thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.